Welcome to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang, currently sheltering in place in San Francisco. Markets mixed today with tech again outperforming the rest. This as investors try to digest the latest moves by governments around the world in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. New York, meantime, signaling it's time to start reopening some things. The state and city giving the go-ahead to some businesses like construction, even drive-in movie theaters, the go-ahead to reopen later this week and reporting the lowest daily death toll in weeks. That said, we're seeing flare-ups in South Korea as well as Wuhan, the original epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Taylor Riggs, who's been covering the markets and taking a look at the latest moves. So Taylor, walk us through the day and again, tech buoying the rest of the market. Yeah, sort of a continuation of a theme, Emily, that you and I have been following really for a few weeks here, where tech has been the big outperformer. The NASDAQ continues being positive territory for the year, while the Dow and the S&P are still lower for the year. So you see there that tech, of course, the NASDAQ 100, big tech, the FANGs, those are all the big outperformers. There are also a few individual big tech stocks that were leading those. Amazon, of course, leading it, uh, as there was a report that potentially they were in talks with AMC Entertainment on the smaller side. Zoom, which is a company that we've come to know very well, was the big winner in the NASDAQ 100. As people think offices, honestly, may not even open up until next year. Google and Facebook are among those companies that have told their staff to get ready to stay home through 2020. NVIDIA is also another stock that ended up more than 3%. They hit a record high after Needham, an analyst over there, raised the price target to 360 a share. She's really optimistic about the gaming business because we're all at home playing games. We're not coming to work. And then, of course, on the data side of things, there's increased demand for both public and private clouds. And so that's also something that's really driving that business. So really continuation of big tech, those tech heavy stocks really outperforming everyone else. Meantime, we've got to talk about biotech Gilead's treatment, obviously hitting hospitals now. What are analysts saying? So as we know, technology and healthcare sector have really merged really in the last few years. So biotech clearly the leader and really the focus as we all look to the pandemic for a potential vaccine, a potential way to treat this disease. So Gilead has a drug, remdesivir. It's been approved to be used in emergency cases and patients in hospitals. They're donating, Gilead is, 600,000 vials to hospitals, about 78,000 of them in the next six weeks. There's going to be a total of about a million and a half vials that they're going to be donating worldwide. The U.S. though only expected to receive about half of those. New York State, as we know, which has been uh, really the epicenter of the pandemic here in the U.S., has received the largest donation so far. Analysts though thought that the U.S. could receive up to 80 percent of the donations. So there was a little bit of a disappointment there. Still, Gilead came out and said that they personally don't decide the allocation that's up to the federal government. Uh, still, Gilead has proven to be a company really with strength here as biotech has become the forefront of really stock sentiment about where we are within this pandemic. Meantime, chips uh, a concern today after reports that the Trump administration is in talks with various chip companies about producing and manufacturing more chips in the United States versus Asia to reduce reliance on the Chinese supply chain. What are you hearing? This is a story about a turnaround. Emily, we came in and Sox was leading the declines lower and slowly throughout the day started to inch up higher and higher. As we know, this pandemic has created some concerns about the dependence on the supply chain over in Asia. So over the weekend, we did hear from the Trump administration some reports that they were looking at companies like Intel, Taiwan Semiconductor, on making some of those chip makers open up plants here in the U.S. to reduce our reliance on Asia's supply chain. So Sox, of course, was in negative territory and then eventually sort of ended up closing in near positive territory. Once you got some analyst reaction, though, coming out and saying that this might not be a bad thing in the near term for a lot of these companies. I'll bring you a few. Stiefel analysts said that the report, frankly, isn't surprising, but they do not believe that any decision is going to be imminent and there is no near term financial impact on all the chip makers involved. And I'll bring you one more. Analysts over at Citigroup said that they came out and said that an expansion is possible for bringing manufacturing plants from those chip makers here in the U.S. 
but they really highlighted the time and the resources that go in to building up a plant and scaling to the type of volume that you're going to see. That takes a lot of time. And so near term, there won't be a financial impact on these companies. That's when you really started to see these companies then turn positive and brush off a lot of worries that they had over the weekend. All right, Taylor Riggs for us in New York. Taylor, thanks so much for breaking it down. I want to dig into some of these tech themes that we've been covering and bring in Scott Kessler of Third Bridge, global sector lead over there. Scott, obviously there's so much to talk about in the world of technology and the moves that we're seeing, but I do want to start on this chip issue, uh, this reporting that the Trump administration is in talks with various chip companies, including potentially Intel, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, about moving production to the United States to reduce reliance on China. What's your take on this and, and what it would mean for these companies? Yeah, thanks a lot, Emily, for having us today. Um, look, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that based on we do at Third Bridge, which is talk to C-level executives and industry experts um, about what's going on and what will go on in the world that could influence investment and business decisions. Um, what's going on in terms of investment in the U.S. is a big question. And it's not surprising that you have a situation where the government that we have is encouraging a combination of more companies producing uh, goods in the United States and perhaps disconnecting supply chains from overseas, China in particular. Um, based on experts that we've spoken with, um, the supply chain was the first and primary issue when the coronavirus started taking um, hold around the world. And it's pretty obvious, based on those conversations that we've had, um, that the supply chain is going to have to be reimagined and re-implemented. That said, there have been calls for the supply chain to be evolved for so many years, and you've seen companies maybe taking small steps to diversify, moving into Southeast Asia a little bit, moving into India a little bit, but really it hasn't happened. And if you look at a company like Apple, which has maintained the bulk of its supply chain in China and, and just reported strong results. You had uh, Apple CEO Tim Cook saying that the supply chain remains strong and not disrupted. I guess I wonder how easy it's going to be to convince these companies to move on over to the United States when it's so much more expensive and obviously going to take many, many years to do so. Yeah, look, I, I think... It's a fair point. It's something that's been discussed. Um, but I also would acknowledge that look, we talk with a lot of people, and those people know the sectors and industries very well. And I think it's widely acknowledged that the supply chain in this coronavirus world has proven to be a pretty significant operating risk for a lot of companies around the world. So getting that additional push to bring production increasingly back to the U.S. in many cases. Um, perhaps now there's um, not just a greater notion of doing this, but also a greater will that really hasn't existed in the past. Okay, so let's talk about these broader work-from-home trends that, you know, obviously technology is enabling a lot of this. We know that some tech companies will be, you know, will see a boost because of all of this activity. What are the trends you're zeroing in on in terms of trends that perhaps live on post-pandemic? I think that's that's really kind of the key question. It's not necessarily solely um, what are the key questions right now, but what of these trends are going to kind of, you know, continue well into the future? I think like a lot of folks, we're thinking about digital transformation, shifts to cloud platforms. You mentioned remote access, collaboration tools, video meetings, um, and video games, which I think was, was mentioned in, in the prior um, conversation you were having. Um, and it is noteworthy on some level, right? I mean, we've spoken to a lot of experts as it pertains to companies like Zoom and Microsoft as it pertains to Teams and Slack. And I think it's pretty obvious when you see everyone from Facebook to 
Alphabet slash Google increasingly committing to this category with Microsoft indicating that they're going to roll out a Teams for uh, individual and, and family use. Um, this is going to become an even more competitive space that should lead to more innovation as well as, I think, greater benefits um, for users. And don't forget, of course, that Zoom has been um, increasingly investing in security as well. And honestly, this is something that we've been talking with folks about for the last number of months. So we're thinking about that category. Um, another area that we've been focused on is kind of digital and social media advertising. Um, we've talked with many experts across this category. And the one recurring theme is that advertisers, um, if and when they're spending, it's almost like back to basics. So they are recommitting to everything from Google search to Facebook um, and Facebook remarketing and retargeting X efforts. Um, and they're really not necessarily as inclined um, to experiment with let's say, uh, less tried and true platforms. And so based on conversations we have, um, it seems like Twitter is perhaps more vulnerable uh, than some of the other ones. Um, another topic that I think is you know, worth mentioning is the notion of not just the fact that we're seeing greater video game consumption, but also the fact that there is a lot of um, engagement in terms of users and the revenues are flowing therefrom. But on the other hand, you also see development uncertainties where you have teams around the world that are being put in positions where they have to put out games where there is tremendous demand. So we see puts and takes right. um, when it comes to the video game industry, but digital acceleration, that is the name of the game, pun intended, I guess, in a lot of these categories. <laughs> Okay, uh, Scott Kessler, always good to have you on the show. Scott Kessler of Third Bridge, appreciate hearing your views there. Uh, coming up, Elon Musk's battle with the California government continues this time vowing, or is it threatening, to move Tesla's headquarters out of California. We will discuss next. This is Bloomberg. Uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Many times We're listening to President Trump speaking here at the Rose Garden. This, of course, after uh, Vice President Mike Pence's aide and press secretaries tested positive for uh, the coronavirus last week. The White House has now ordered staffers to wear masks. Uh, throughout this discussion, the president has said he's not seen the vice president since the quarantine period. He's not aware of any additional staffers testing positive, uh, that he's only talked by phone with the vice pre president during this isolation. Uh, he uh, has said he'd consider um, mandating tests in nursing homes. Um, of course, we know that that is where a uh, number uh, of the most severe outbreaks of the coronavirus have been uh, around the uh, across the country and around the world. Um, we're going to continue to listen to uh, this exchange, President Trump speaking at the Rose Garden right now. But we're going to move on now to Tesla and Elon Musk. Elon Musk battling it out with California authorities and threatening to move Tesla out of the state of California as the shelter in place continues here and Alameda County's sheriff has told Tesla they cannot yet reopen. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Tana Hull, who's been covering this story. And another round of tweets, Tana, from Elon Musk over the weekend, uh, threatening or perhaps vowing to move the company out of the state. Tell us what the latest is. Well, so the latest is that Musk is tweeting again just very recently this afternoon that he's going to be on the production line today, that the company is going to be operating operating today in violation of the Alameda County Health Department's orders, and that if they come to arrest anyone, they should arrest him. So he is openly defying the county health order, which was basically that they could not start production again. So this is a real, this is really ratcheting up the pressure on the county, which are, you know, government officials who have basically been trying to deal with COVID-19 
for weeks now. Um, you have one of the largest and most prominent employers in the county openly defying an order that most other businesses are following to the letter. So it's really quite the showdown. And, um, you know, it's I mean, it's never a dull moment, but the, the speed with which this news cycle has kind of accelerated today has been pretty profound. So let's talk about the tweet. Uh, Elon Musk tweeting, frankly, this is the final straw. Tesla will now move its headquarters and future programs to Tesla Nevada immediately, Tesla slash Nevada. If we even retain Fremont manufacturing activity at all, it will be dependent on how Tesla is treated in the future. Tesla is the last car maker left in California. Meantime, this from Alameda County, this has been a collaborative good faith effort to develop and implement a safety plan that allows for reopening while protecting the health and well-being of the thousands of employees who travel to and from work at Tesla's factory. So, uh, You've got a more um, level-headed, I suppose, response there or comment from um, the Alameda County officials. What would it take for Elon Musk to, to really move manufacturing out of the state of California? Do you think that this is something that he is actually going to follow through on? Uh, I, I think it would be pretty, pretty hard to do that. I mean, I could see Tesla moving their headquarters from Palo Alto to a city like Austin, Texas, for example. I mean, a lot of Tesla's chip team is already based in Austin. Musk himself spends a lot of time in Texas because of SpaceX. Um, you know, he's very fond of the state. And so, I mean, I could see them actually moving headquarters, but to, to like the, the Fremont plant, Tesla has poured billions of dollars into getting that plant up and running. They've upgraded the paint shop. It has the capacity to produce 500,000 cars a year. To just sort of pull the plug on an auto plant and think that you can sort of get a new one in a new state without a lot of capex spending and without a lot of subsidies, it just takes a long time. I mean, you know, but who knows? I mean, he's very frustrated, obviously, with California government, and he's using this as a threat. And, he's, you know, he's been very upset that Fremont has been idled for as long as they have. And now he's openly defying the county. So, you know, I'm not sure what his end game is here. Um, I mean, the, the response from California politicians has been pretty interesting. But, it, you know, you, a factory is pretty hard to just pull the plug on. There's a lot of supply chain issues, employee training. And remember that, you know, California has supported Tesla for years and, you know, longer with all kinds of public policy incentives. The state has been very pro-EV. There's all kinds of tax breaks on manufacturing equipment that the, the company has been able to, you know, take advantage of. Um, so to, to kind of recreate that kind of package in another state would be difficult. All right. Well, I know you're continuing to follow this uh, as the situation changes by the minute. Dana Hull, uh, who covers Tesla for Bloomberg, thanks so much for that update. Coming up, can the Trump administration force chip companies to start producing chips in the United States? We will discuss that next. This is Bloomberg. The Trump administration is trying to get semiconductors to start producing chips in the United States rather than relying on the Asian supply chain. This according to a report from Dow Jones. Here to discuss that and the broader state of the chip industry, we've got John Newfer, CEO of the Semiconductor Industry Association on the phone. John, thank you so much for joining us. So first of all, what's your reaction to this report that the Trump administration is in talks with various chip companies about moving production to the United States? Now, first of all, very encouraged uh, that the, the government is moving in this direction. But let me just clarify, um, we already uh, produce chips in 19 states in the U.S. Um, of our companies that manufacture, about uh, half of that manufacturing is, is done here. Uh, uh, but the, the, the broader picture, the global picture, is roughly about 12% of the world's semiconductor manufacturing happens in the U.S., and that percentage is probably going down. Most of it happens in Asia, and I think that's what the Trump administration is focused on. That said, the supply chain is very internationalized. I mean, is it really possible that one country could become so self-sufficient and produce all of it takes to make a single chip in the United States? Yeah, so I, I don't think that's anyone's objective. Uh, you're absolutely right, Emily. The 
semiconductor industry is probably the most global in terms of supply chains. Um, we get our efficiencies because of those supply chains. But um, I think the need now and the focus right now of the Trump administration is to uh, bulk up uh, the, the amount of semiconductor manufacturing we do here. I think that's the focus. I don't think the focus is to do it all here. I think that's unreasonable, not really workable, wouldn't make sense for economics. What does the chip industry want here? I mean, we're talking about companies like Intel and Taiwan Semiconductor. Do you get the sense that they are listening and what it would take uh, to get them to make these kind of dramatic moves? Yeah, so I think one of the big problems over the years has been foreign governments, national foreign governments, have put together very impressive incentives uh, for semiconductor manufacturing. And so in the U.S., the way we work here is it's the states that create those incentives. And there's no way a state can compete against uh, a foreign government. And so it's, it's been a big imbalance. And what's happening now, I think, is the, our friends in the federal government are recognizing that it's time to, to move more aggressively, to uh, make more investments in our industry, in terms of, of who, who, who is going to create more manufacturing here, you know, uh, you know uh, anybody who can, who can do that is, is a good thing for the entire industry. All right, John Newfer, is certainly a story that we'll continue to follow. CEO of the Semiconductor Industry Association, thanks so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, coming up, we're going to be talking about the housing market and some brutal honesty from a CEO about how he could have put his own employees at risk in his own response to the coronavirus pandemic and what he's doing differently now. That's coming up. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. We knew that we'd been talking ourselves out of a reaction for too long and that my delays could have already put employees at risk. A shutdown was only a matter of time. Those are just some of the frank words penned by Redfin CEO Glenn Kelman detailing how the company has responded to the pandemic and not always in the most timely of ways. These are the first of three entries in a diary that will be rolling out and started going online today. Earlier, I spoke with Kelman about how he has navigated this crisis and the decision to lay off employees and more. Take a listen. I think the reason I wrote the post is because I wanted to celebrate the team that came together. So many decisions that we made that turned out to be good ones were decisions that I opposed initially. I wasn't interested in virtualizing home tours because I thought people had to see a house to be able to buy it. I wasn't interested in raising capital because I thought we could find a way through. And our CFO and our chief product officer and different executives at different moments stood up to me and said, you're making a mistake. And if we hadn't had that culture of dissent, the company would have been really screwed up. Now, you talk about the moment where, you know, suddenly demand in Seattle and the home buyers essentially disappear. And you say yeah. you have, uh, there's this point where you have a hundred million unsold houses on the books and a thousand idle employees. Obviously things have changed because now we're sort of yeah. used to this, but how different is now from that moment when you realize that? Well, what's changed is that we've had four straight weeks of increasing demand. So it's been a very volatile time, almost all through March. It was one express elevator to hell going down. But now in April, week after week, demand has been coming back. There's a massive asymmetry in the market where buyers are out in force, but nobody wants to sell their home. 
So it's still hard to say what's going to happen to the real estate market. But I think it was hard for us because we decided to let a thousand people go on furlough at the beginning of April. And then almost as soon as we did, demand really started coming for us a good week right after that. And then another good week and another good week and another good week. So at this point, we've brought back about 250 people out of the 1,000 and we plan to do more over the next few weeks. And you're having a lot of success with these virtual tours, which yeah. you know you mentioned earlier was something that you opposed. You talk to us about what's working, what's not working, yeah. what you've learned and what yeah. might last beyond the pandemic. Well, I think what's happening is that people are previewing almost every home online. So you're still going to see the property you end up living in for the next 20 years in person before you buy it. But we can write the contracts so that we agree on terms, we agree on a price, and then the owner clears out and lets the buyer into the home. So even in a pandemic, it's easy to see the property without putting anyone at risk. But virtualizing that experience, creating three-dimensional scans, doing work around video chat tours was something that involved a rogue team. So Jonathan Eldridge, Christian Taubman put their neck on the line and said, this is going to work. I know we tried it three years ago and it didn't work and some people left the company over that. But sometimes the idea that you tried too early that you become viscerally opposed to as a result is the best idea. And in this case, it saved our bacon. It's what kept this company going over the past eight weeks. Now, in my own neighborhood, there's a house down the street that had 23 disclosure packets out. So those are 23 yeah, people who yeah. wanted to buy just one home. Yeah. What sort of signals are you seeing about demand that might give us yeah. some indication of what the housing market looks like over the next six yeah. months? So I've been through this before. In 2008, when there was a recession, inventory was piling up month after month, and prices were only going in one direction, which was down. But now in April, we're seeing that inventory is actually down 25%. There aren't enough homes to buy. Home buying demand is at 96% of its pre-pandemic levels, and that's even after you adjust for seasonality. So the issue is that buyers see this as a sale, an opportunity to get assets at a discount, and sellers aren't ready to list those assets. And so we're going to have more bidding wars this summer unless some homes come onto the market soon. So what does that mean for pricing, Ben? Well, prices right now are stable, if not up. It feels crazy to say that they can continue to go up, but we are about to run out of homes to buy. We are at near rock bottom levels of inventory. There were structural reasons that there wasn't enough inventory in the market even before this pandemic started. We can't build houses, zoning laws are screwed up, all sorts of stuff. But right now, if you add to that, that nobody wants to sell a home unless they absolutely have to, you just see the mother of all inventory crunches in our future. Now, working from home is creating these sort of massive corporate and potentially even cultural shifts that may live uh -huh. on long after this. And there's talk about reshaping the workplace, reshaping yeah. cities, this flight to the suburbs, or maybe it doesn't matter where you live if yeah. school's not in session and everything is remote. How does that impact the housing market? Well, it's a seismic shift to small towns. So if you compare the traffic for listings that are in a city over a million to traffic to listings, population under 50,000 towns, the towns are twice as much traffic right now. It has been a trend that was happening before the pandemic because there was such an affordability crisis in San Francisco and Seattle and New York and LA but the pandemic has really put an exclamation point on it. If you can work from home and have a job at Google, why would you pay to live in Mountain View? And so lots of people are looking to other places where there's a better quality of life, where homes are more affordable, and their employers are gonna let them do it because we've learned as employers that people work hard from home and that we're glad just to have them on board. Now, initially, there was all of this discussion about who'd be the first to return to work. Now it seems there's a race to be the last the to last, return to work. Yeah. You mentioned Google. Google's already told employees they can work from home through the end of the year. Same with Facebook. You know, are we going to see more of that? Is that something that you're considering as a CEO? Because, you know, I'm just yeah. curious just how deep this trend will persist. Well, we're in no rush. Why would we ask people to come back if they're uncomfortable being in a room with one another? So I personally am ready. I need to be in an office again. My kids are driving me crazy. I'm probably driving them crazy. 
but I think most people just feel really wary of being in a closed space with their colleagues. And so it might be all year, it might be part of next year. Uh, we just don't feel the need to make any decisions before we have to. And maybe the reason I feel that way is because there's so much decision fatigue where every day we've been making one decision after another. And this is a decision that we don't have to make right now. So why would we? What about commercial real estate? We've seen mass layoffs at places like Airbnb, Uber, Lyft. I mean, you've had them at, at your own company and laying off people means you don't need as, as much space. Are we going to see a huge contraction in the commercial real estate market? Long term, we've all signed these five or 10 year leases, at least the large tenants have. And when you call and say, look, no one's even in the space, give me a break. You find out from your landlord that they're struggling too. And so WeWork was obviously having trouble before this. I think the fact that they bet so much that commercial real estate would be in high demand for 10, 20, 30 years was the undisclosed risk in that business or is disclosed, but not many people recognized it. So commercial real estate is going to be in a pickle for a long time to come. Glenn Kelman, the CEO of Redfin there. Well, the coronavirus has highlighted who can and cannot work from home, as Kelman discussed, who wants to continue to work from home and who wants the economy to reopen. Coming up, we'll discuss that and more with SurveyMonkey's CEO, Xander Lurie. That's next. This is Bloomberg. As more countries and U.S. states continue to ease their lockdowns, the question keeps on being asked, is it too soon? SurveyMonkey has been surveying millions of Americans about their feelings about the economy reopening and the continuing health crisis. Joining me now, SurveyMonkey CEO Xander Lurie. And you've surveyed, Xander, more than half a million U.S. adults since uh, mid-February. Talk to us about what they are telling you in terms of their feelings about the answer to that question. Is it too sure. soon or not? Great to see you, Emily. Thanks for having me on. Uh, we've been in the market talking to tens of thousands of people a week. As you said, now we're approaching a million people in the U.S. in the last three months. And as you can imagine, we saw a spike in anxiety. Um, it, it was peaked in mid to late March. And we've seen a tapering off of folks who are as worried about the global economy, worried about their own family health. But on your specific question, we have 63% of American adults have, have told us they are more worried about businesses opening too soon than getting back sooner. And as you would imagine, like every other topic in America, it's highly, highly partisan. So we have been segmenting the data by men and women, black and white, different industry workers, and 85% of Democrats are worried that we're going to be getting back to work too soon. 60% of Republicans think we need to get back to work sooner. So you can see that the politics in America, sadly, um, layers into the health crisis as well. So where are you seeing some of the biggest shifts? You know, one of the things that stood out to me from the data that you provided is that, you know, in many ways, you know, from the same kind of people, opinions actually aren't changing. So if opinions aren't changing, then what will? Well, I think what's going on is that, um, Corporate leaders, organizational leaders, are going to have to step up and, and make some bold moves in terms of how we are getting back to work. If you are waiting for the government policies uh, to lead here, sadly, we are going to have to lean on our organizational leaders. And if I can make a sales pitch for SurveyMonkey, uh, this is what we do. Our products have never been more relevant because we are enabling leaders of big companies, nonprofits, educational institutions, government bodies, to solicit the kind of feedback they need from their stakeholders um, to make the right decisions. And so for the first time, C-suite is really starting to think about how are we gonna feed our employees when they get back to work? How are we gonna operate elevators? Public bathrooms are big concerns. And so everybody wants to get their people productive as soon as possible, but we've gotta do it safely. And the best thing you can do in unstable times is listen to your stakeholders. And that's where our products can be helpful. Now, companies as big as Google and Facebook have already told their employees they can expect to work from home through the end of the year. Instead of there being a sort of race to uh, get back to work first, there's this sort of race to be last. And I wonder, there was so much concern about 
underreacting, but now could we be overreacting when having these discussions? Well, Google and Facebook and SurveyMonkey, we're incredibly fortunate that we don't manufacture anything in a plant and we don't have a retail storefront. So I have great empathy for companies that actually make stuff in factories or you know, they depend on store traffic to sell their goods. Um, you're seeing this massive uh, separation in America today of the haves and have nots and you know, this cloud transformation, what was gonna happen over the next five to 10 years is literally happening over the next five to 10 months. So you're seeing a lot of engagement around products that help people work from home productively and companies like ours are you know, incredible beneficiaries of that. So we reported out our earnings last week. But companies that don't have to get back so, to work are going to be able to take their time and, and be a little bit more thoughtful about policies relative to other companies that need to stay in business, uh, got to get back to work this summer. They've got to really get on the dime. So for a company like yours, I mean, how are you planning the return to work? I mean, are you even talking about it yet? And do you think that Come 2021, you're going to be a lot more comfortable with large chunks of your workforce just working from home going forward. Oh, this is a massive sea change in the work world, like unlike anything we've ever seen before. The longer we are in an environment where you're able to work productively from home, and we're shipping as many lines of code, our VPN connections, Zoom minutes, time on Slack, sales calls, you know, the company is thriving in this work from home environment. People are eager to get back to work, especially those of us like you and me who have you know, kids in the house. We know people want to get back to work, but we've got to do it in a different way. And we're really trying to reimagine a better return to work. And we know that you're going to have a more prescriptive now, return. There was so much, I mean, the big story going into this pandemic was the U.S. presidential election. And suddenly uh, that took a back seat to this you know, gigantic health and, and economic crisis, but you're seeing, uh, you're continuing to look at the data and obviously you see continuing divides along party line. Are you, are you seeing anything interesting that would lead you uh, one way or another on just how uh, this presidential election might play out given that, you know, President Trump has, like it or not, been the person who has been responding to this and, you know, many people can, can agree with with his approach or, or disagree with his approach but I wonder what that means for his odds come November I mean the thing I found so striking is the political divide in terms of the coronavirus data and the going back to work data and just how how tightly it aligned with your political status putting that aside we saw a big bump in the approval ratings for President Trump in the early days of this crisis those have all but subsided so you're seeing his approval ratings kind of taper back to where they were pre-crisis and he continues to enjoy huge support amongst Republicans and terrible support amongst Democrats and obviously independents are different. I think there's a ton of time left on the clock, Emily. It's, it's May, this election is not until November. Uh, we've seen Trump push a lot of the leadership about getting back to society and normalcy, back to the governors. Um, so we're seeing states really have to step up and we're seeing companies and government bodies, um, municipalities have to step up. So. How that plays into the political election, we will keep asking questions of, of the citizenry uh, and glad to share those with you as the results come back. So speaking of the time on the clock, you've been in Silicon Valley for a long time, and I'm just curious, how hard do you think this is ultimately going to hit the tech economy? And we've, we've, we've seen huge chunks of companies getting laid off, 25% at Airbnb, 14% at Uber, more to come, 17% at Lyft. You know, this is certainly unlike anything Silicon Valley has ever experienced before. What does the wreckage look like on the other yeah. side? Look, I mean, I think the, the global economy and the, the shrapnel in the U.S. economy is huge. No business is immune from that. I mean, unless you have a specific, you know, product like Zoom or Clorox that is, is tailor-made to help uh, during this crisis, no company is immune from 30 million people being out of work. And it's a, it's a terrible shame, and we know it's hitting minority communities worse than uh, the public at large. So every technology company is going to have to, uh, to react to this. And you know, we, we've been saying agility is the new superpower. And we just continue to put software products out there to help companies communicate with their stakeholders to be responsive because your marketing is going to change, your pricing, your, your packaging has got to change. And really how you think about your teams getting back to work and servicing your customers is going to change. So yeah, the, the layoffs have been terrible and we feel for uh, the economic hardship that so many people are feeling right now. But through crisis also comes opportunity 
And there are plenty of silver linings about how people are adapting, changing their business. And you've seen amazing, um, you know, adaptability by companies who are figuring out new ways to reach their customers, serve their customers. And the longer this crisis goes on, the more we're going to have to hope that that innovation continues. All right, Xander Lurie, CEO of SurveyMonkey. Good to have you back on the show. Thanks so much for stopping by. Uh, as we've been speaking, we've been getting some headlines from an interview that Bloomberg News is doing with the director of the National Institutes of Health, Francis Collins, who's just said that likely we'll need more than one vaccine for COVID-19 and that different groups of people may need entirely different vaccines. Certainly interesting and potentially uh, sobering news there. We're going to continue to follow uh, headlines from that conversation, which has been happening while we were speaking. Uh, coming up, we're going to be talking about AMC and movies. AMC shares soar after reports that Amazon might be interested in a takeover. We'll discuss next. This is Bloomberg. Headlines coming in on DraftKings. George Soros has taken a $66 million stake in the sports betting companies, one of several big name investors, to receive shares of DraftKings through a deal that took it public last month. Uh, we're going to continue to follow that story. Meantime, continuing in entertainment shares of AMC Entertainment skyrocketing after a report from the British newspaper, the Daily Mail, said that Amazon has been considering a takeover. Joining me now, Bloomberg News, Kelly Gilbaum from L.A., who has been following the story. First of all, Kelly, we should point out this is an unverified report. So why did shares respond so dramatically today? Yeah, thanks so much, Emily. And that's very good to point out to look at this with a good degree of skepticism. And I think it's that people are just really hungry for information on what's going to happen with these theaters. Uh, people are probably starting to think something's got to change here. The business model is under an incredible amount of pressure and was even before coronavirus started because of competing uh, entertainment uh, sources on people's devices. And now uh, with the coronavirus, they are completely shut and these businesses tend to have a lot of debt. And so people are wondering what's the way out. And this report today sort of offered an, an answer to that, although I'm not sure that, that that really is the answer, but that's probably why people were reacting so strongly to it. What do you make that of the fact that the, the company that could, you know, is, 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 is Amazon here, which of course has... Uh, it's Amazon Prime video service, but is still yet a much smaller player in the streaming business if you compare them to, say, Netflix or Disney. Yeah, I think for Amazon, they do release movies, but I think still for them, any sort of big M&A like this would need to benefit the e-commerce business. And I'm not sure how buying AMC would do that. Um, they occasionally release movies into theaters, when, uh, which they have to do if they want to be considered for awards. But for the most part, they're releasing their uh, films and television shows online, and that's doing pretty well. And AMC is a very physical, very capital-intensive business. And, you know, like I said, the business model is under so much pressure. So I'm not sure why Amazon would really want to take on of the debt and difficulty that would go along with owning a, a really big physical theater chain right now. Meantime, you have Disney reopening its Shanghai theme park in China today, obviously in a very, very different world. What do we know about how that went and, and what this means for Disney? I know it's a, a small part of their business, but this is a, a symbolic move. Yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. It's a very important test. Um, this is the first kind of uh, time we're going to, first opportunity to see how people are going to react 
to uh, the ability to gather and mass again since this all started. And I think today, uh, I think there were some lines that were there up to 30 minutes, which is pretty good. But you know, patrons are still having to uh, adhere to all the social distancing rules, so they still need to stay six feet apart and wear masks. And the rides are half empty, so it's a bit of a changed experience. But I think just given you know how Disney said it lost you know, over a billion dollars or a billion dollars of profit that was going to be there wasn't uh, because of all the social gathering restrictions. This this is going to be important uh, of a test case for Disney uh, to see what it's like for them going forward. All right. And we'll keep watching that one. We'll continue to watch how uh, it goes at the park over the next few days. Bloomberg's Kelly Giblom, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you all for watching this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Bloomberg Daybreak Australia is next. I'm Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg.